as we see, you know, ignorance today uh, used to generate hatred and, and hatred used to justify violence against innocents. As, as the ambassador's already mentioned, you know, from, from Ukraine to Israel and Gaza to Syria to Yemen to Iraq, I think we need Singapore's example more than ever. Uh, and in particular, its example of tolerance and how our human, uh, common humanity can transcend you know, ethnic and religious and cultural differences. So hey, we do have a lot to talk about, as the ambassador alluded already, uh, today as we bear witness uh, to today's cascading crises from the war in Ukraine to the wars in Gaza and across the Middle East, as we contemplate also looming crises from the South China Sea, as the ambassador mentioned, to the Taiwan Strait, to the Senkakus and Ryukos, uh, to the Korean Peninsula. We tend to view these conflicts and potential conflicts discreetly, and therefore we miss connections between them. We should remember that it was just before Russia's unprovoked reinvasion of Ukraine in February 2022, that President Vladimir Putin and Chairman Xi Jinping issued their joint statement prior to the Beijing Olympics, celebrating their partnership with no limits and announcing a new era of international relations. Consider how after nations around the world, including Singapore, imposed sanctions on Russia, Moscow deepened its dependence on Beijing for purchases of oil and gas necessary for the cash needed to fund its increasingly expensive war and for the hardware and components necessary to sustain its war-making machine. And we should not neglect how, in addition to financial and material support, Beijing's diplomats and wolf warriors have amplified the Kremlin's propaganda and misinformation to justify this special military operation as somehow a war against NATO aggression or a war to denazify a country led by a Russian-speaking Jewish president. Uh, but the many connections across today's conflicts extend far beyond Moscow-Beijing cooperation on Ukraine. Consider as well how the Russian-Iranian-Syrian axis has enabled the serial episodes of mass homicide in the Syrian civil war killing or displacing half of the population of that country and placing pressure on neighboring countries uh, and, and on Europe as well. Russia has helped Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps perpetuate not only the civil war in Syria, but also sectarian civil wars or fitnas across the Middle East to help Iran keep the Arab world perpetually weak while establishing its land bridge to the Mediterranean. Iran has returned the favor by enabling Russia's onslaught against Ukraine's people and its infrastructure through the export of Iran's missile and drone complex. And not to be left out, as, as uh, the ambassador alluded, you know, North Korea has provided Russia with over one million artillery rounds, likely in exchange for help with Pyongyang's missile and nuclear weapons programs, and certainly at least emotional support for Kim Jong-un's recent intensification of threats to South Korea and threats to security in Northeast Asia and beyond, including the resumption of ICBM or inter intercontinental ballistic missile testing. But you know, that was all even before Hamas's mass murder attacks of October 7th, 2023 which included heinous acts of infanticide, as well as rape, torture, and kidnapping. Iran helped Hamas, an organization that shares Tehran's professed intention to destroy Israel and kill all the Jews, build its terrorist infrastructure and capabilities. Russian support for Hamas goes beyond Russian arms, including Cornet missiles, to its extensive support for Hamas diplomatically and in the information war against Israel. Putin seems to have taken October 7th 
as a present for his 71st birthday as he has used the crisis to intensify his missile and drone attacks on Ukraine, launch a, po a propaganda campaign against the United States, and curry favor with other nations through a seemingly pro-Palestinian stance after supporting Hamas, the organization that diverted international assistance away from the Palestinian people and into terrorism, used the Palestinian people as human shields, and provoked a war that they knew would result in the death and displacement of the Palestinian population in Gaza. It is worth noting that none of the extensive tunnels underneath Gaza are available to the civilian population in Gaza for shelter. As it calls for a ceasefire in Gaza, Moscow has assumed the dual roles that it plays alongside Iran in Syria as well. The roles of arsonist and fireman. Moscow, the arsonist, enables Tehran as it activates its so-called axis of resistance. That axis is really a network of proxy armies and terrorist organizations from Iraq to Yemen to Syria to Lebanon to the West Bank to Gaza. Iran's cynical strategy is to expend Arab lives in pursuit of its ambition to push the United States out of the Middle East as a precursor to the destruction of Israel. Then, after helping Iran keep the Arab world weak and enmeshed in conflict, Moscow the fireman offers its services as a peacemaker or a moderator of Iran's ambitions. It is important to recognize these connections if we are to work together to counter this emerging Beijing, Moscow, Tehran, Pyongyang axis of aggressors and prevent these crises from continuing to cascade from Europe and the Middle East into the Indo-Pacific region. The members of this access are already working together, and it is reasonable to assume, at the very least, that they will take advantage of the world's preoccupation in one area uh, to, to, uh, to accelerate uh, their objectives uh, in the Indo-Pacific. As Xi Jinping has said, the most important characteristic of the world today is, in a word, chaos. And he has also said that the times and trends are on our side. So it is reasonable to conclude that the perception of Russia's success in, uh, Russian success in Ukraine or Iranian success in the Middle East would encourage aggression by the two other members of this axis of aggressors, Beijing and Pyongyang. Xi Jinping could conclude that, hey, it's time. It's time to lash out against what he has called the all-around containment, encirclement, and suppression against us, which sounds to me a lot like an echo of Putin's claims that NATO or Ukrainian Nazis posed a threat to Russia. That is why supporting Ukraine's efforts to defeat the Russian invaders, reestablish security, rebuild, and develop a long-term ability to defend its sovereignty against future attacks is vital to security in the Indo-Pacific region. And that is why supporting an outcome in the Israeli-Hamas war and the broader regional conflicts such that Hamas and other members of Iran's terrorist network are defeated and there is progress toward enduring peace and security for Israel and the Palestinian people is also important to security in the Indo-Pacific. Otherwise, Xi Jinping might be encouraged to pursue his Marxist vision, as he put it, of seizing the historical initiative and continuing to move in the right direction revealed by history and act, in his words, to build the community of common destiny for all mankind and better integrate the China dream and the world dream. To me, those phrases echo Imperial Japan's slogan, 
of greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, a term rolled out the year before the attacks on Pearl Harbor and the initiation of the centripetal offensive across Southeast Asia that culminated where we are today. The call to integrate the China dream and the world dream are not just words. The CCP has published a white paper that describes how the party intends to achieve that vision through four programs, the Belt and Road, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, and, sounds pretty scary to me, the Global Civilization Initiative. So maintaining resolve to overcome the aggression against Ukraine and across the greater Middle East is important for any nation that is not enthusiastic about signing up for the CCP's vision and important to any nation interested in preventing what would be a disastrous conflict in either the South China Sea or in the Taiwan Strait or in Northeast Asia. So what can nations do beyond supporting Ukraine in the fight against Iran and its axis of resistance? We can discuss openly, as we are today and as we will during the question and answer, the ambitions and strategy of the strongest member of the axis of aggressors, the CCP, and deny the CCP the ability to describe its aggression as benign or beneficial. That requires understanding what I like to call the three C's of the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party strategy, co-option, coercion, and concealment. China co-ops countries and international corporations and elites through false promises of impending liberalization, insincere pledges to work on global issues such as climate change, and especially the lure of short-term profits, access to the Chinese market, investments, and loans. Co-opting includes that soothing language like common destiny designed to lull us into complacency. CCP leaders speak the language of cooperation and global governance while conducting one of the greatest peacetime military buildups in history, suppressing freedom at home, weaponizing its authoritarian mercantilist economic model, conducting massive cyber attacks and cyber intrusions, and subverting international organizations. At Davos, Davos Xi Jinping pledges carbon neutrality by 2060, while his country builds approximately 50 coal-fired plants globally per year. He gives speeches on free trade while engaging in economic aggression and unfair trade and economic practices, including forced labor. He boasts of the superiority of the CCP system while he confines millions of people in concentration camps and wages a campaign of slow genocide against the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. The recently published paper by the State Council offers a new vision for building a better world. One must wonder if that vision includes bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier, maritime militia attacks against the Vietnamese and Philippine navies or others that challenge the CCP's claim of ownership over the South China Sea. Davos Xi Jinping and, and CCP leaders at Davos tell investors that, hey, China's open for business. While China uh, the, and, and the party cracks down on the tech sector and uses the national security law to crack down on firms that try to provide some degree of transparency uh, into Chinese companies. Co-option depends primarily on the party's belief that we listen to what they say but ignore what they do. But co-option is more than just words. It includes predatory loans and debt traps set for corrupt or weak governments, as well as Chinese investments and promises of access to China's markets. Economic co-option makes countries and corporations dependent and vulnerable to the second C, coercion. The party coerces others to support or at least not object to its efforts to extinguish human freedom internally as it did in the case of the U.S. National Basketball Association, 
uh, or to stifle other criticisms of the regime as it did with the campaigns of economic coercion against Australia and Lithuania, or to impose cost on U.S. allies for having the temerity to defend themselves, such as the sanctions on South Korea for deploying missile defenses. And it applies coercive power to turn international organizations against their purpose and in favor of its authoritarian mercantilist model. Examples include the CCP's subversion of the World Health Organization, the Human Rights Council, uh, the World Trade Organization, and UNESCO, just to name a few. Obviously, coercion has also a military dimension with the threats against Taiwan, the Philippines, Japan, India, and Vietnam. All those countries can attest to what they've seen in terms of coercion from the People's Liberation Army. But that third C, concealment, may be the most important because that's what allows the party to pursue co-option and coercion with impunity. The party's secret weapon of double speak and reversal of the truth allows it to mask its various forms of aggression and the growing threats to security as benign or just normal business practices. The stakes are high because if the CCP succeeds in its strategy of co-option, coercion, and concealment, the axis of aggressors will grow stronger and the world will be less free, less prosperous, and less safe. So let's consider maybe the first steps we can all take to counter the three C's correcting really and correct two fundamental uh, misunderstandings that allowed the CCP to conceal the danger that it poses to the world. The first misunderstanding is that Chinese aggression is the result of U.S.-China tensions and it's a reaction to the Trump and Biden administration's kind of mean description of China as a rival. This misunderstanding rests on the assumption that the party has no aspirations of its own and has no volition except in reaction to the United States. But even the most cursory survey of recent Chinese Communist Party actions should correct this misunderstanding. Consider the party's deliberate suppression of the COVID-19 outbreak, the persecution of doctors, journalists, and others who tried to warn the world, the subversion of the World Health Organization. Consider the addition of insult to injury with the global wolf warrior diplomacy uh, effort attempting not only to obscure China's responsibility for the pandemic, but also to portray its draconian zero COVID response as superior and indicative of the advantages of its system. Consider the massive global cyber attacks on medical research facilities in the midst of the pandemic and the punitive cyber attacks on uh, an economic coercion of Australia and others for having the temerity to suggest, hey, maybe we should take a look at, at where this virus came from. Consider the expulsion of international reporters and the party's unabashed use of hostage taking to coerce foreign governments, as well as the roundup of so-called Taiwanese spies. Consider the extension of the party's repression into Hong Kong and the imprisonment of those like Jimmy Lai and others across China who advocated peacefully for rule of law, minority rights, and equal access to education for migrant workers. Consider Xi Jinping's boasts of his intention to expand concentration camps in Xinjiang and build the Great Firewall higher. Consider physical aggression by the People's Liberation Army, as I've mentioned, from the, as India's Himalayan frontier to the South China Sea, to the Taiwan Strait, to the Senkakus and the Ryukus. It should be clear to all that, hey, it wasn't Donald Trump right? and it wasn't Joe Biden who caused that behavior. In 2013, the Grand Master, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew asked, will an industrialized and strong China be as benign to Southeast Asia as the United States has been since 1945? We now have the answer to that question. And the first step that we might take is to acknowledge that CCP aggression is not in reaction to the United States. And it's not a US problem. And it's not even just a Southeast Asia problem. It is a whole world 
problem. I often hear from friends in, in, in Singapore and across Southeast Asia uh, in particular, hey, we don't want to choose. Don't for, we don't want to choose between Washington and, 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 and Beijing. You know, but the choice that Beijing is forcing on other nations through its global initiatives and the strategy of co-option, coercion, and concealment is not one between Washington and Beijing. It is a choice between sovereignty and servitude. The second misunderstanding is that competition with China is dangerous or even irresponsible because of a Thucydides trap that presents us with a binary choice between passivity and destructive war. That is a false dilemma. And I would argue that passivity in the hopes of accommodating and cooperating with the CCP led to further aggression in the South China Sea and elsewhere. By 2017, passivity had, I believe, put us on a path to what would be a disastrous conflict. The strategy for a free and open Indo-Pacific formally adopted by the Trump administration in February 2018, and you can look this up on the internet, <laughs> uh, it appears under my signature, uh, made clear that transparent competition with the CCP was intended to prevent unnecessary escalation and enable rather than shut down cooperation with China. But the CCP loves the false dilemma associated with the, the Thucydides trap as they portray efforts to defend against its various forms of economic, informational, cyber, and military aggression as simply the status quo power, the United States, trying to keep the rising power, China, and its people down. As U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said in an important speech two days ago uh, in California, even as we compete, we have to find ways to live alongside one another. And competition, alongside and with and in cooperation with like-minded partners, is the best way for all of us, all of us to help the CCP leadership come to the realization that they can achieve their dreams without resuming its imperial status and impinging on the sovereignty of nations in Southeast Asia and beyond. It is important to acknowledge the connections between ongoing and potential crises and to correct those two misunderstandings about the nature of the competition we face. Failing to do so could prevent us at this, what I believe is a critical moment in history, from countering the axis of aggressors, protecting our sovereignty, preventing ongoing conflicts from cascading further and restoring peace to our world. In conclusion, I would just like to point out that I have used the clunkier, longer phrase of Chinese Communist Party and CCP instead of China for a reason throughout this talk, to distinguish between the Chinese people and the party leadership and their policies. I think we should all endeavor as we compete to maximize positive contacts with people and entities in China that are not acting uh, as a hostile arm of the party. Of course, the space for that kind of interaction has diminished uh, a, lot for, a lot for Americans in particular, uh, and this is why I think Singapore plays an extremely important role in that as well. So let, let us wish uh, for peace, prosperity, and health in the year of the dragon. Gong Shi Fa Chai. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, General, for that uh, very direct and uh, realistic assessment. I think it's best now to let our audience fire some of their own views and questions for you. You can tell I'm not a diplomat, right? Could you figure that out? Yes. <laughs> but my job is to make you even less of a half diplomat. Yeah. I think you are still quite diplomatic. Yeah? So my job is to get all my friends here in the audience to poke you and uh, get you to be even more uh, aggressive. Uh, I think by nature you are quite aggressive, right? Oh, yeah? <laughs> Not the US guy, but the US military guy. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's start off with uh, some questions and comments. Try to do one question or one comment at one time so that we have more people to participate. 
and then just give us or let the general know where you are from, what the, who are you and where you are from. Okay, the, over there. Uh, uh. The microphone is on. Anybody else has a live microphone? Maybe we start decide any other questions? Comments? Mm. Just the one to... Uh, good morning, uh, General McMaster. I'm a big fan of your Goodfellows podcast that you talk with Neil and uh, John regularly. Um, and um, I just wanted to talk something relevant to what you said today, and that is I read Neil Ferguson's very important essay on the treason of the intellectuals. And uh, I wanted to ask you, in, in terms of the US-China relations, I think what's going on in the universities in the United States is actually quite relevant uh, in the sense of when you look at Chinese universities like Tsinghua, Fudan, and Peking, they're rising up the rankings, they're focused on meritocracy. Um, and when you look at, for example, Adrian Wardridge's book, um, the, the Aristocracy of Talent, um, China is continuing to maintain its meritocratic traditions, and I think had, this has big uh, foreign policy implications. Um, my question to you is, um, one, do you think that the United States, in light of, um, you could say, um, challenges regarding the universities, that they will be able to reform this? And second of all, what are your advice for people like myself, who is a New Zealander, who loves liberal values? Is it wise for my, people like myself to consider studying in the United States when this problem is ongoing, or do you think it's better for us to consider alternative means? Oh, and um, my name's Leonard. I'm a master's student in international political economy um, at RSIS. All right. okay. So Leonard, hey, thank you. And I want to plug my other podcast called Battlegrounds, in which I interviewed Richie McCaw for, in front, before the, uh, the Rugby World Cup, uh, a, a famous New Zealander all black. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, I, I think this is a, it is a big problem. I think in, on campuses in the United States, and uh, in terms of the 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 you know the effect, I think over time, of of I would call it almost like a capture of some of the humanities departments uh, in U.S. universities by what I would call kind of a neo-Marxist new left interpretation of history, and this has always been there in U.S. universities, and that's okay. That should be, I think, an interpretation of history that that students get exposed to. But it's just become almost an orthodoxy, and it's blended together, you know, with various post-colonial theories and critical theories, uh, post-modernist theories, really, that uh, that draw into question, you know, the virtues uh, of our own societies, and and I would call it almost a curriculum of self-loathing, you know, in uh, in in, in, uh, in American universities. Uh, when I, when I teach, you know, I I don't sense that among our students. I think that that there is a, you know, kind of a vocal minority that engages in this activity. And, and of course, what you've seen with some of the pro-Hamas uh, uh, demonstrations and so forth as well, and the kind of weak response of some of the, the university administrators is, is because so many of these students and so much of this faculty teaches that you should look at the world through the lens of, um, of, of really uh, the oppressed and oppressors and categorize everybody into those two categories. And this is kind of the weird way, you know, in which, you know, the Jews become the oppressors and Hamas, an organization that I would say has inflicted more harm on the Palestinian people uh, than anybody since 1948, you know, uh, ha has, uh, uh, has actually uh, escaped kind of responsibility. So it's an issue. It requires reform. I'm confident, I think, that those reforms can be made. You've seen some of the leadership change. And you know, I teach at Stanford. You know, Stanford is not known as like a conservative institution. Uh, but we talk about these, these, con these ideas, you know, and, and the readings that I give my students, I give them readings that might be more sympathetic to this worldview and those that are opposed to it. And we discuss it openly like you should in, in a university, right? And I often tell my students, you know, hey, you have an important job as a student in a university. And that is to question everything you hear and read and read other perspectives. And if anybody tries to ever force an orthodoxy on you, it's your job to correct it, you know. 
And this is why I'm confident is, is because of our free and open society and this kind of discussion uh, that we can resolve these issues. You know, America's always had ups and downs and difficulties. And you can see that today, certainly, with the political polarization. Uh, you know, Donald Trump, whatever you think of Donald Trump, you know, he's not you know, typically regarded as a unifier, right? And so I think whatever happens in this next election, uh, there's going to be a, a great, you know, great deal of kind of, uh, you know, partisan vitriol, you know, and, and, uh, and that's going to play out in the regular media, on social media, and so forth. But what's great about our system is, is that we have the opportunity for self-correction below the threshold of revolution, you know, because we have a say in how we're governed. And so what I, when I look at the, at the degree to which uh, Russia, for example, has attacked our country with uh, Russian new generation warfare or cyber enabled information warfare, I think it's a misunderstanding to think that the Kremlin really cares who win, wins American elections. They don't really care. What they really want is that a vast majority of Americans doubt the legitimacy of the result and thereby lose confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. Too many Americans you know, have been on the side of the GRU you know, and, and the Internet Research Agency and, uh, and, our, and our, our adversaries uh, by playing into that. You know, and so, so I, I, what I hope for, and you know, whether it's on college campuses or more broadly in our political discourse, uh, is, is for us to come together for meaningful, respectful discussions, begin on what we can agree on, and also to demand that our political class not compromise confidence in our democracy to score partisan political points. You know, and that's a message I hope a lot of people will carry forward into the election, no matter who's nominated and runs against each other. Thank you. There's a qu question over here. Hello. Hi. Hi, um, General McMaster. This is Josh from uh, Bloomberg News. Uh, I have two questions. Um, I think uh, Indo-Pacific countries would uh, very much appreciate the U.S. security presence in the region, uh, but at the same time, they would like to see more economic participation from the U.S. as well. Yeah. So I was wondering how would the U.S. Have plan to advance IPEF um, as with the elections coming up? So that's my first question. My second question is about um, the Taiwan Straits and the broader U.S.-China relations. I think following the elections of um, Lai ching -de, um China had a pretty muted response to Taiwan. Um, and that's in line with the other reapproachment in U.S.-China relationship as well. So I was wondering, like, do you see that as more of like a temporary um, gesture, or do you think that that points to something that's more concrete, sort of like a uh, resumption of more normal exchanges? Thank you. Great. Okay, so first on IPEF, for anybody who's uh, listening to the question, is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework and, and, uh, and the U.S. and other countries' ability to, to maybe provide an alternative, right, to... to um, to Chinese predatory loans and, and economic practices, which I think is important, as, as well as to promote, you know, fair and reciprocal trade. This is, you know, if Donald Trump becomes president again, I mean, that's that's his two his, his favorite word is reciprocity, right? And and um, and I think what you saw with the Trump administration, and what you would have seen, by the way, in the Hillary Clinton administration, <laughs> is is a movement away from kind of unchecked globalization. And the belief that you know that there was such a thing as free trade, when you're trading with countries who actually uh, put up barriers to entry to their market or engage in practices uh, that that are counter to the idea of reciprocity. So you know, th th I think that's carried over with the Biden administration. Obviously, there hasn't been a relaxation of any of the tariffs on China, for example, to counter. Uh, China's weaponization of its mercantilist model against us. I'm talking about obviously, you know, theft of intellectual property uh, and uh, and and state subsidies to produce goods at artificially low prices, dump those goods on the international market, and drive you out of business, basically. Uh, and there's also been a recognition that the the migration of the industrial base, not just out of the United States but around the world. Uh, to the southeast coast of China was artificial and actually dangerous to national security, right, and, and a robust economy, uh, as well as a recognition that supply chains that have become over-reliant on single points of failure, uh, especially in, in China, are a vulnerability, right? And, and, and the Ukraine war brought a lot of that, you know, a lot of that home to everybody as well with the degree to which Russia had 
built dependence, uh, you know, or made Europe dependent, Germany in particular dependent, on uh, on on Russian natural gas, and then hoped to use that for course of purposes. It didn't work out, but I think it was kind of a lesson that everybody everybody learned. So um, I think whoever comes in is going to probably have uh, a even more invigorated approach to what I would call economic statecraft, uh, which is an application of the tools necessary to compete with Chinese economic aggression. And those tools are obviously um, inbound investment screening, what we call the CFIUS, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States, to ensure that there isn't money coming in from an adversarial government uh, or you know, that, that, is, that is meant uh, to extract technology and extract intellectual property, especially those technologies as intellectual properties that have defense implications. And then outbound investment screening to make sure, you know, we stop underwriting our own demise. I mean, I mean, U.S. smart money invested in China has developed a lot of the PLA's capabilities. I mean, the company that does all the battlefield artificial intelligence for the PLA uh, was funded in early series of, fu of funding uh, from two big U.S. private equity firms. You know, uh, I mean, and there's a whole list of, you know, a whole list of of of, uh, of these kind of cases. Uh, the tools of for repressing um, their own population uh, have been developed by Chinese companies that, that had big U.S. investments in them. So it's smart money investment, but also it's especially the index fund money that pours into China. I mean, like, why? Because of the lack of transparency of those Chinese companies, right, as, as they crack down on the, on the companies Bain and others, you know, who are trying to provide transparency, why would retired, you know, uh, why would pension pensioners uh, you know, firemen and policemen in the United States help the PLA develop the weapons that they might try to use to kill their grandchildren, right? That doesn't make sense. So I think the index flows will be, will be cut way down even beyond what they are now. Um, and then you're going to have, obviously, a continued emphasis on export controls in critical areas, uh, like you've seen in the semiconductor sector. But there's going to have to be much more investment in making supply chains more resilient. And that's, you know, batteries and the upstream comp components of batteries and uh, mineral refining and separation tech and so forth. And that's going to require another tool of economic statecraft, which the Biden administration has not yet been willing to really take on, and the Trump administration probably would, which is very significant deregulation, you know, to, uh, to, you know, to be able to, you know, open a mine, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and, to, and to manufacture more easily. Um, and, then, and then finally, it's investment, you know, I think in in, uh, in resilient supply chains that go beyond uh, go beyond China, and, and it doesn't have to all be in the United States, right? This is the idea of friendshoring. And this is where I think what you're alluding to is there is a real need for trade agreements. And I think that hoping for a multilateral trade agreement beyond something like IPEF is probably not going to happen in either political party. There's just not, there's just not the political support among Americans because of, of the, the difficulty that many Americans encountered associated with China's entry in the WTO under the assumption that China would play by the rules, and then China's subsidization of their industries and so forth, and, and then and the effect on American manufacturing, especially in the middle part of the United States, right, where, where places like Dayton, Ohio, the swing states for an election, right, where people lost their jobs, and where Donald Trump is the most popular, right, because this was his, this was his message. You've been left behind by the people in Washington, right? These globalists, you know, and free traders. I was, I was labeled a globalist. It's kind of a low bar to be labeled a globalist in the Trump administration by the Trump people, you know. But uh, so, so, so I, I think, uh, I, I think the prospects for multilateral trade agreements are low. But, but bilateral trade agreements, you know, they're slower, they're tougher uh, to do sometimes. Now, I think those ought to be goals. And you saw what, what happened with the renegotiation of, of the U.S.-Japan trade agreement with, uh, with the, the U.S.-South uh, Korea agreement. I would love to see agreements like that, you know, with, uh, with Vietnam, for example, which is very protectionist and is not, you know, is still trying to figure out how it's going to evolve economically, let alone from a governance uh, point of view. Uh, but, but, you know, other, other countries in Southeast Asia, certainly. And, and so I, I hope that works ongoing now. I think it, I think it is. And then maybe expanding the IPEF a little bit, like it did on on digital trade standards and so forth. You know, I think that's all good. Uh, but you're not going to see like, I mean, I don't think TPP is coming back. You know, and and uh, for in terms of the U.S. signing up for the program. Taiwan. Oh, hey, Taiwan. Okay, so um, 
I, I don't. I think it's temporary. You know, I hope it's not temporary. This this thaw in the relationship and and uh, and kind of the muted response to the DPP victory in in Taiwan. Um, I hope that's the case. I really do. You know, but uh, it is it is important. I think that the PLA uh, back off uh, U.S. naval vessels and aircraft like they have. Uh, because you don't want to have another Hainan Island incident like we had, like in 2001, wasn't that? I think it was, um, and 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 a, and a chance for escalation associated with that. So, um, hey, I'm all for better relations, right, with uh, with uh, Chinese leadership, uh, and and uh, but I'm also all for not letting the guard down, you know, on the various forms of of aggression and competing again in a very transparent way. Hey, I'll tell you a story, like when when President Trump went to. Uh, to meet with Xi Jinping. He said something to him, this is 2018, November 2018, that I think was really important. So he went kind of through a litany of you know, our grievances, you know, with intellectual property theft and, and barrier to entry to the Chinese market, lack of reciprocity, state subsidies, forced labor, uh, you know, all that. And then he, then he looked at Xi Jinping and goes, I, I don't blame you for all this. I blame us for all this because we let it happen without taking any action in, in the area of you know, trade enforcement mechanisms or whatever. So, so um, anyway, I think that's the approach we ought to have, right? That, that hey, we're, we're going to compete. It's logical that we compete, as any nation should compete. Uh, and, and we, you know, we acknowledge that we vacated competitive arenas, you know, for, uh, for too long uh, and got pretty far behind. Today in the newspaper, uh, we read that uh, in the equivalent of a parliament in Taiwan, the speaker, as you will call him, or president of the assembly, is a guy from the other party, yeah. not the DPP. So I think in the coming months and years, there will be more complicated uh, politicking in Taiwan. Yeah. And hopefully uh, your friends in the US Congress will know how to avoid getting into the hot soup. Let the Taiwanese figure out themselves what they want to do vis-a-vis -vis China. Yeah, anyway, that's my wishful thinking. Hold on. Uh, Mary? Hey, Mary? Thank you. Uh, thanks for a very intriguing uh, presentation, General. Uh, my name is Anne-Marie Schleich. I'm a former German diplomat, and uh, I'm with RSIS. Um, when you were talking about the various crises that the US is facing, you mentioned, of course, the Russian war against Ukraine. What I was missing was that uh, um, the European, the, the word allies and friends, because European countries are mostly affected by what's happening in the Ukraine and have been together with the US, been financing and supplying with weapons the, the Ukraine. So I think that is something that needs to be acknowledged, uh, together, of course, with the welcoming of more than three and a half million refugees from the Ukraine. The other question I wanted to ask you actually is, um, what is your comment on the present position of the Republican Party in the Senate regarding support for the Ukraine? Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll just say I agree with you on, on, on uh, allies in, in Europe, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the war in Ukraine. I kind of just took that for granted in my talk. And what I was trying to do in the, in the, in the talk is to, uh, is to make connections between, you know, between the conflict in, in Ukraine and other conflicts in the Middle East and potentially in the Indo-Pacific. And our, our, our need, along with our NATO allies and European partners and, and really you know, our, our friends uh, in, in uh, Southeast Asia and beyond, to see the connections between those, those conflicts and, and work together against you know, what I'm you know, characterizing as an axis of aggressors. Uh, Europe has, has stepped up, I think, in an extremely important and significant way in terms of the support for Ukraine, uh, but, but also in recognition of the need to share defense burdens, for example. I'm talking about Olaf Scholz's idea of Zeitenwende and, and, uh, and the investments in defense. Uh, to, to share the overall defense burden in Europe while supporting Ukraine um, with uh, defensive capabilities, but also, as you mentioned, for refugees, right? And, and, uh, and this is obviously uh, you know, Germany, but Poland, of course, in a, from a per capita perspective, or, or GDP perspective, has, has, uh, has provided tremendous support in many other countries in Europe. The latest uh, approval of the $50 billion plus package of support 
for Ukraine from the European Union, I think is really significant and shows the degree to which the European Union, you know, an organization that at times, you know, lacked maybe the unity of effort to, you would think, to be effective. Um, it, was, it was great to see the organization overcome kind of the obstruction of Viktor Orban in, in Hungary and others, you know, who were preventing the passing of that uh, economic support package uh, to Ukraine. In the U.S., the dynamic uh, right now on, on, uh, on aid to Ukraine is really driven by very few numbers of congressmen and women in the House of Representatives. Because they have a very narrow uh, majority in the House of Representatives, and that has amplified their voice, there is a wing of the Republican Party in particular that I would characterize as kind of a neo-isolationist wing, uh, people who have tapped in to many Americans' discontentment about transitions in the global economy, you know, after China's entry into the WTO, the, this goes back to the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, um, this, you know, layer onto that, you know, social media, you know, and the polarizing effects on society, an opioid epidemic, right? I mean, you know, COVID. I mean, these are people who are, you know, who feel as if the government's left them behind, they're angry. And the sentiment is, hey, we have enough work to do here in the United States, you know, let's get our own act together first. And this is why you see the coupling of the border security initiative, you know, and legislation with aid to Ukraine. Now, I mean, personally, I wish they would just pass the darn Ukraine aid package, you know, and, and, uh, but I do think it, it's going to happen. It'll happen at the 11th hour. It'll be a very significant support package for Ukraine, I believe. Uh, and, um, and, and I think it will get Ukraine through this difficult moment, you know, that they're experiencing now. Uh, you know, the war is in a very critical stage. We could talk more about that if you want. Um, so I think the support from not only Europe and the U.S., but from everybody for Ukraine is really important at this juncture. Because whereas you've seen kind of the shakeup in the, in the military command in Ukraine and, and uh, the losses they take and everything, I think the situation is even worse on the Russian side. I really do. You know, I mean, authoritarian regimes, you know, like, uh, you know, like Putin's regime, uh, they, can, they can give the impression of looking strong. Uh, but they're actually quite brittle, I think. And even though, you know, it's not really in contention who's going to win, you know, the election in Russia, uh, I think you're beginning to see some, some major popular discontentment there and, and a tremendous strain that's been put on the Russian people. You know, I mean, nobody would wish on Russia what has happened since uh, February of 2022 with uh, the massive losses. You know, there have been over, you know, a half a million people have died in that war, you know, on, on both sides. Uh, so, so, and this is, has been the most destructive war in Europe since World War II. You know, it's, it's really, this is why I think it's weird. It's such an important moment now, you know, and, and Europe has stepped up. I mean, I think Europe has defied all predictions, especially by Russia. Why did Russia reattack in 2022? I would say reason one was the U.S. humiliating withdrawal from Afghanistan, which portrayed weakness in the U.S. It had also a lot to do with perception of weakness in Europe, a stoplight coalition, you know, government in Germany. You know, the SPD leading that coalition and the SPD had been bought off previously, you know, the former chancellor uh, by Gazprom. You know, you had uh, you had a contentious election in France. You had remember Boris Johnson was in trouble, you know, for the parties at number 10 Downing Street. So, you know, I mean, it, I think they just I think Putin just looked at the West. And if you reread the speech that I quoted uh, briefly uh, right before the Beijing Olympics, you know what the real message of that speech is? Hey, you know, Europe. The United States, you know, Singapore, you know, you're finished. We're in charge now. Get used to it. That was the tone of that speech. Now, things aren't working out as well as they hoped for, for you know, the axis of, uh, of uh, aggressors. Yeah. It was not a speech. I mean, a joint statement, joint statement for the Olympics. Uh, thank you, General. Name Sui King, Sophie, solver of problems. That's very important because I noticed that you, you, you are a general, you look at many aspects of America and the world because you see that America need to get your act together. When Steve Forbes came here to campaign for McCain, I told him America defeated Sony Japan again, not by Plaza Accord, but by the inventive Intel and Microsoft. 
So it is important for America to get the act together to drive again. I think that is what Donald wants you to bring back to him. I'll provide you more details. <laughs> I have in-depth interaction with his household people and though the campaign manager that he brought back to Trump Tower. Okay, the next thing is, may I comfort you that the ambassador of Islamic countries that stationed in Beijing has go in and out of Xinjiang and never see one million, do uh, one million people in uh, concentration camp. I think yeah, they must be not be looking very hard, man. I mean, you know, what I, mean? I mean, I'm sorry, but Sir, hey, just just go. To, I mean, have you been to just, just go, go just go to that far right wing publication, the New York Times, okay, and uh, and I and think read. Donna say it's a you fake know, news. and 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 read. And, I think and read you must the, remember, Donna say it's a fake news, right? Well, I so uh, okay, uh, maybe you have to travel to Xinjiang and have a look. My friends are experts in investigating studies. Okay, yeah. do not ignore. Uh, ambassador, senior ambassador of developing countries, especially Islamic countries. I, I hope you take the notes and I can spend some time with you because it is for the peace of the world and the progress, peaceful progress of America. And Donald needs your help and my help. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Young lady here in front. Where is the microphone? Hi, good morning, General. Thank you for your mar remarks. Uh, this is Alicia from Tomasic. Um, we saw during the first Trump administration the effort to impose tariffs and trade restrictions, but that was towards a specific purpose. The president wanted a phase one and phase two trade deal. And, um, you know, but from our neck of the woods, we think the train has left the station on any of those endeavors, and the restrictions are now designed towards a different purpose. And you've, you've um, really drawn the distinction between targeting China writ large and ta targeting the CCP or sort of making that the focus of policy. Could you outline sort of what are the tangible policy objectives that these new raft of measures are targeted towards? What are the specific aims that Washington is now trying to achieve with these policies if it's no longer a trade deal? And to that point, um, you know, your remarks about the need for signing bilateral agreements is, would be very welcome in this region. How should we square that with the president's sort of, uh, well, Mr. Trump's threats to levy global tariffs? Uh, on on these economies. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of global. I'm not going to answer for Donald Trump on global tariffs. You know, I just think that you know, I mean, one of the things I would say to him is like, if we shoot all of our allies to get to China, China wins. You know, so the steel and aluminum tariffs, for example, you know, on on Germany and and uh, Canada, you know, under national security, really Canada. I mean, so I mean, I, I, I never bought into that, but under, but under the 301 investigation, which is on intellectual property theft, I think that was uh, that was smart. You know, as well as the tariffs. That